when people who are in power are doing ridiculous things unchecked. Yes. It's a mentality of growthism and constant growth. Uh, and of course, the only thing that grows continually is cancer. I feel like, you know, we've dug ourselves into a really bad place where we know what we, what we did wrong, but we actually don't have a good path to getting out of it. Is capitalism effective at fighting the climate crisis? Great, so let's start with the prompt. Um, capitalism is the driving force behind economic growth, which leads to increased consumption of natural resources, pollution, and loss of biodiversity. Today we've brought New Yorkers and Extinction Rebellion activists together to evaluate capitalism and its ability to solve the climate crisis. Can capitalism save the day? Right, it's, it's not necessary. It's, um, it's proven to be useful and it's somewhat of an advancement when you look at the span of human history. Um, but it has, it is not perfect by any means and it's not going to on its own, through its own mechanisms, solve the climate crisis. And part of the reason for that is capitalism looks at costs and benefits, and that's sort of the idea that it balances. Mm -hmm. But so many of the costs are externalized, and it has a hard time getting those external costs put back into the thing without civic action or without the engagement of the population to ensure that capitalism accounts for the true costs of what's going on. Yeah. And with the climate crisis, there's no way to do that until you have direct action. Yeah, I think when we talk about capitalism, it's important to start the story a bit earlier um, with colonialism, um, which paved the way for capitalism. Um, and those two things, colonialism and capitalism, paved the way for industrialization and um, our militarization complex. So, yeah, basically I think that when we have an institutionalized system that's based on exploitation and um, exponential growth, that's never going to be something that can be sustainable. I want to weigh in. I wanted to go last because I know that I was going to kind of throw a bit of a curveball. Because when you talk about colonialism and you talk about the beginnings of capitalism as mercantilism being about exploitation yeah. of a, a particular person that you want to keep at the bottom will be your your consistent labor force or your, your person to beat on so that you can enjoy whatever you want to enjoy, do whatever you want to do, make whatever you want to make, and not worry about the sustainability of it all. And, and we can have forms of capitalism where we have companies and corporations, but these CEOs don't have to make billions and billions of dollars when the workers have to use, you know, uh, Medicaid and Medicare and have to use food stamps. There should be more co-op or cooperative ways that corporations are going to spread the wealth out so that we will have living wages and people are not living in these you know, deplorable conditions. And that's what climate change is also about when we look at environmental justice. Yes. It's the same thing on the backs of these same people yes. who had yes. crosses burned on their lawns. Yes. Now mm -hmm. they are contaminating the water yes. with lead. The air is polluted. Yes. The land is polluted. Yes. They're doing all this experimentation. So it just, those, that type of oppression hasn't changed. It yes. has just morphed. And when those people are beaten down so much that they don't have time to be a climate activist because they have to work. I'm sitting here because I'm, I'm so super blessed that I have the luxury to yeah. be here. Yeah. I call myself the token, yeah. Because you know what? I have a different type of ancestry and lineage as an African-American here, as yeah. a fourth generation college graduate. Mm -hmm. Both of my parents graduated from college. Mm -hmm. That 10% rule that, that you see in ecology, mm -hmm. that's me because we were able to sustain ourselves. Sustainability is big. So when we talk about capitalism and we look at the damage that is done and we connect it to white supremacy and climate, these things have been put in place on purpose. And if we don't shake the status quo, we're gonna to continue to have these problems. That discomfort that people, oh, I don't wanna be uncomfortable at this moment. There's consistent and constant discomfort. So we have to be cognizant and empathetic about the fact that your comfort 
also means someone else's discomfort yes. and not just someone, but all of humanity's discomfort. So let's wake up and let's stop trying to be so cutesy. Oh, 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 I'm going to catch the vapors. Get out of that damn so life and be for real. Because if the tables were turned, what would you do? Would you just lay down and, and not try to rock the boat and go with the status quo? Or would you try to speak up? I'd like to discuss um, what alternatives do we see to capitalism? Actually, I, I'm, I'm not sure that capitalism is the key problem. Capitalism is a force multiplier. It can m make everything go faster and bigger. The key underlying problem is industrialism, which capitalism has made worse. Industrialism, the phenomenon of human being thinking yeah. that they are not a part of biological life, that they are not a part of the ecosystem, yes. right? Yeah. That's the, like, when you see yourself separate from, from the ebb and flow of life, yeah. that's when the problem starts. Well, that, that started, like, with agriculture, with civilization, where we separated ourselves from nature. But which civilizations? Because some see. civilizations oh. stay connected to their agrarian ways. And just like with the Native Americans, many tribes, they dealt with sustainable agriculture in the Three Sisters yeah. and ensuring that they before that European science, they made sure that there was a nutrient cycle that was sustainable so that you don't have soil degradation. Yeah. So you yeah. can't say which civilization, but who decides who is civilized? Like the, the Europeans came and they didn't realize that they were looking at land that was actually managed and cultivated. That's right. They, they used just chestnut right. forests, right? right? So they were a, a part of that, of that cycle of life. They had inserted themselves in very intelligent ways into yes. the cycle of life. Yeah, it's, right? the, it's the disconnect that happens when Descartes creates like yeah. articulated dualism, right? That we're separated, that man is separated from nature. Mm -hmm. What you were saying about industrialization, I think the other issue that capitalism is a force multiplier on is, is this idea of growthism. I think that's part of the, the major issue. Yes. It's a mentality of growthism and constant growth. Uh, and of course, the only thing that grows continually is cancer. So I think, <laughs> yeah. uh, and out of control. So there, there, we should have, mm -hmm. we should be working toward an idea that's, uh, you know, some people call it um, degrowth, or you, I think Ooh, we have to think about, we have yeah. to think about new ways to talk about that because, to, but I think it could be sustainable growth. I think it could be the idea of a new economy that's focused on, on a sufficiency. But I think that any economic system that we have should not be focused on growthism. It should be focused on what are the needs of people and making sure that people are able to live prosperous, thriving lives and funding education, yeah. um, funding health care. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think refocusing, whether it's, again, the, the terminology we get into these traps, but I think if we just shift away from this idea of growthism to one yeah. of being sustained uh, and, and balanced, that's, that's what we need to move toward. Bill or Julian, do you want to weigh in? No, I live in New York City. I'm not going to be able to, su to support my family by growing my own food and by yeah. not relying on industrial agriculture yeah. and not relying on other sort of outputs of, of our current economy. And I feel yeah. like, you know, we've dug ourselves into a really bad place where we know what we, what we did wrong, but we actually don't have a good path to getting out of it. And it's not as simple as saying, let's deindustrialize or let's go back to the to the land because in fact there are now lots of people who um, if we made food way more expensive would starve to death and there's lots of people who wouldn't be able to you know stay warm in the winter if we made if we made it impossible for them to for example use um, you know even fossil fuels today yeah. and you know it it kills me to say this but we do need to think about how to propose solutions that are that do strike at the root of the problem, but don't raise up yes. the possibility of like other forms of suffering. exploitation, yeah. death, suffering yeah. of lots of people. So yeah. it's gonna be a really hard hole to dig out of, but we gotta keep be. that in mind. Julian, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so Shayok mentioned industrialism and this idea that we are almost, so it, it, what it reminds me of is the sense that as human beings, we're the objects and that the subject is the industrialism and the industrialization, right? That, and I wonder if that isn't sort of part of what the problem is. We're no longer the subjects. I know you mentioned Descartes and the separation between us and, and the rest of the world. Um, but uh, 
I do wonder if that's part of it, where we see ourselves as objects in something that's much, much bigger and limited in our ability to change things. And I also feel that like, that's a big part of what's driving XR to act the way they are. It's a, it's a cry of um, wanting agency in a world, but I think it's very interesting, whether it's capitalism or whatever it is, that it's so hard for us to put our finger on exactly what it is that we want to do. Counter argument could be that if you look at the cost of energy today, decade ago, fossil fuels were, were, were the standard because there was nothing cheaper and it was too expensive to produce renewable energy. The scale at which solar, wind, I think as well, has, has, has dropped in cost and the way you're seeing the beginnings, we have a long way to go, but we're seeing the beginnings of decarbonization, at least specifically in the energy industry. Other industries are still a problem. But that, you could make the case that that is a direct result of investment, research and development, investors, people with money deploying capital towards solutions. That's capitalism. What, what do you guys have to say about that? I would say that um, <clears throat> I, I, was, I, I look at documentaries all the time and I was looking at some of the larger, newer structures that, were, um, that have been erected in China. High-speed railway, we still have our industrial revolution rail system in the United States, which is ridiculous. And one would argue that they sacrificed human rights for, you know, industrialization. But at the same time, we could have done it. But, at this, at, but on the other end, when you talk about Descartes, who is he speaking for? He's not speaking for me because I don't have that. I am so connected to Mother Earth. I can smell when it's going to rain. I can feel when there's going to be an earthquake. So when we, we, when we talk about these philosophers, we have to be careful about who we call people and humans and who we're doing this for because... I don't have that type of humanity. So when we look at the development of these particular industries, they all can be developed sustainably. But when someone who is used to that bottom line, making that top dollar is producing and they don't care, then we're not going to have that type of mindfulness in how we create and how we share energy and how we produce energy. The sun is, is, is totally renewable. It, it's not going to burn out for some millions of years from what I've heard. But isn't, we it, have isn't wind. it due to capitalism that solar uh, yeah, is it's, a solution it's, it's that not, is scalable? It's not just, and I like that question because it's not just about quote unquote capitalism. It's about greed. It's about people who say, I have this infrastructure. Instead of me trying to transfer it, which some are doing now, I can change these, this land usage to this particular production and actually save the earth without trying to frack and make the water flammable. I can make sure that we are using the wind in these particular areas. Looking at the continental shelf, shelf on the East Coast, the greatest thing in the world that people should have been paying attention to before. But the difference is the mindfulness of it. Who's doing it? Is there, is there unchecked power? Because that's the problem we have in this society too. When people who are in power are doing ridiculous things unchecked, yeah. and then we don't have the right efficacy and the right ethics in any work that is being done. So we have to make sure that right. people speak up and say, this is right. wrong, let's bring attention to these yes. wrongdoings, and let's do it better, let's do it right. So, so about the, the fact that like, like the solar was like, you know, it's, it's apparently a product of capitalism, I would question that, because a lot of the advancements of the, the scale of production was done in China through government incentives, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not sure if you could exactly call that capitalism as, as government encouraged industrialism. Yes. So, and the other issue that you we are facing with this capitalism and solar is that because in the United States we are following this strategy of only carrots and not sticks mm -hmm. which is like oh we'll give investments for solar and wind it's not really working out because the fossil fuel corporations have so much money that they can do so much propaganda yeah. to, to defeat the advancement of solar. There were yeah. like huge projects in New Jersey, offshore wind projects in New Jersey were just canceled because of this huge amount of propaganda. Yeah. We so, got two so, new companies now, so it's not over. Or stay backed <laughs> out, that's okay. We got attentive, I don't know the other people, but I love attentive. Right. So we can't just say, oh, it's over. It's not over because we were like, oh, daddy, daddy, no. 
uncle can drive us to a game. So no, no, no. Can you specifically say what happened in New Jersey? The what? The, the, didn't they mount an astroturf campaign to get the uh, windmill, the the offshore wind defeated? I do a lot in offshore wind. And one thing that, like I said, I used to go to the New Jersey State House and I testify to the Environment and Energy Commission. And we've made a lot of strides. One of the reasons is because I go and I represent Tri-County Sustainability and they know that Sharonda Allen is a spokesperson. So one thing is the message, the messenger, and who is behind me when I'm sent to speak. How many people are in this coalition of 109 municipalities saying this is what we want? And to put that pressure on and to ensure that when we use this IRA funding, that we're going to do things that are sustainable, that it makes sense. Mm -hmm.